Well, should we start? Um, hi, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do. Yeah, so I'm a psychological therapist um, and I specialise in working with people who have disordered eating um, and sort of just helping them change their relationship with food and body image. So, yes, yeah, so I'm very much coming at it from the kind of psychological perspective. OK, and I think you're very open. You've been very open. You're open on your kind of profile, you're very open on your platforms. And since I've been following you um, about your own journey with disordered eating and that you have recovered from bulimia. Yeah. And, you know, would you would you feel comfortable sharing a little bit more about how um, about your own journey with disordered eating and that you have recovered from bulimia? Yeah. And, you know, would you would you feel comfortable sharing a little bit more about how, you know, that sort of your journey there and how you overcame overcame that? Because I think it's a really it's really important to know that sometimes that with the people you are the most vulnerable with and sharing with really can empathize. They have been on that journey. Um, OK, so I'm the eldest of four as well. Um, I'm eldest of four girls. Um, I grew up on a, in a far on a farm in Cambridgeshire and um, my family is very traditional and um, being the eldest child I was sort of um, expected from quite young that I was going to kind of take on the farm and like carry on the family business um, so for, this probably doesn't sound very much related to food but it was quite an important part of my journey I guess in terms of um, how I grew up and kind of the actions that were on me um, so as a young child, um, I think I had quite a kind of idyllic childhood up until about the age of 11. Um, had a lot of extended family, you know, loads of open spaces. Um, it's like really fantastic in many respects, you know, lots of things I'm really grateful for. Um, but when I went to secondary school, um, I changed schools, which was a little bit of a difficult transition. I went from like a really sheltered, kind of protected little school. Where I had loads of really close friends and um, going into a kind of bigger school. Um, and um, I mean, again, it was kind of fine, nothing sort of hugely traumatic, but I think, um, you know, that transition wasn't the easiest, but particularly at home as I became a teenager, um, I guess what had been kind of so um, idyllic and wonderful as a, as a young child um, started to become quite suffocating and, um, yeah, a bit more kind of limiting really, because I guess I wanted to, as all teenagers do, have a lot more kind of freedom and, um, it didn't kind of go quite so well with um, my family and what was expected of me. So I kind of got through secondary school sort of okay, really. I think I didn't, wasn't really myself in lots of ways. I um, didn't have any issues with food at that point, but I wasn't completely comfortable with being myself. You know, I probably kind of compared myself a lot, you know, got a lot of standard teenage stuff really. Um, but then when I went to sixth form, um, it was a bit of a life-changing moment because I think I suddenly realized oh my god there is a whole world out there beyond the farm this is like part of me is like this is amazing like you know I want to go traveling I want to go to university I want to do all these things and um, my family were really like you know you can't do that and um, you know you're you've been brought up to kind of work on the farm and take that on um so that was kind of for me um when issues with food started. So it wasn't, it's quite interesting really, because I think people often think it's all about um, kind of body image and how I looked and everything, but actually probably up until that point, um, I was just a very intuitive eater, just to eat any, everything and anything, I was just had a very, very active life. Um, I didn't even really step out my body really. Um, but going to sixth form, suddenly realizing I wanted to do all these things. I had my first serious boyfriend, and then there was a lot of friction at home. And I just remember like looking in the mirror one day and thinking, oh, I want to change my body. I want to lose weight. And um, I wasn't um, overweight or anything. I was probably about the same weight as I am now. I don't weigh myself, but you know, it's just like normal, healthy weight. And I quite quickly then, I kind of went, I didn't really even know as well about dieting or anything. My mum had never dieted. It was all a bit of a new world. Um, but I quite quickly lost quite a lot of weight very rapidly. Um, so I guess put myself into that kind of classic terrible starvation place where mm. um, you really quickly become preoccupied with food and you know all the kind of negative things that go with that really um, and my mental health probably really massively deteriorated as well just because I wasn't eating properly um, but very quickly that sort of um, spiralled into bulimia probably as of anorexic for about three months um, and 
yeah, so it's very quickly I spiraled into bulimia. And then that was then the kind of beginning of, um, that was when I was 17. And I continued to have bulimia until I was about 24. Um, so I kind of, I still, sorry, I'm talking a lot here. Um, no, but I still, um, I kind of went off to uni and um, I went against my family. And it was kind of like the best thing I ever did, but also one of the hardest things I ever did because I had to live with an awful lot of, um, kind of guilt that I'd done let my family down and kind of gone against everything that I'd been brought up to be and all the rest of it so it was, it was a very difficult time um and I think the way I kind of survived those through a few years and kind of started to work through it all was using the eating disorder and um yes and I mean and sadly that kind of affected my life for sort of seven years um but thankfully I you know I still I was very fortunate in a way that even when I was at university and I went traveling as well, I kind of always had my head above water. So I was still, um, I managed to get my degree. I still had relationships. I was kind of doing things as normal, but I guess it was hugely compromised because the eating disorder was kind of there in the background. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, um, I, I guess that's kind of like a, a sort of summary of how I, you know my early life and how it kind of developed into an eating disorder and then like how I came out the other side and um, obviously then things have been quite different again from my mid-20s until now and I'm in a much kind of better place really um which I can talk a bit more about but I don't know if you wanted to yeah no definitely <laughs> definitely and was there like a pin was a kind can you pinpoint a moment or a time when that that, that shift came for you when you were able to see a bit more clearly that actually the eating disorder wasn't serving you like it had there was something more there was a different kind of life that could be led free of it you know was there how did you overcome oh i'd like to know is how you identified it oh that's did, were you aware you yeah. had it were you aware you you were going through this or was it um like did someone approach you and say harriet maybe you need to address this so i mean i think yeah so i try not to face the questions and just chip in or whatever so i think in, initially um initially um i didn't really kind of realize what was going on too much i guess i was just so in it and um people around me as well i think things what happened with me is um i lost weight quite quickly and then i looked very very thin and ill for quite a short period of time so when i was very thin and ill people um were kind of asking me questions when we're worried, but because I then very quickly spiraled into bulimia, my weight normalized again very quickly. And I just looked back to normal and then I hid it very well. So I kind of stayed under the radar really. Um, and I didn't, I guess in a way as well, things have changed so much back then. And um, it wasn't something you could talk about very openly. Um, or, and if, you know, I did try and go to the doctors once and, um, you know, there's just, there's just no help available um back at that point so I kind of muddled through really um but I think I was kind of quite fortunate that I I never saw it it was going to be something that I was going to have to live with forever like I really um I really saw this was a kind of temporary blip and it was a really horrible phase but somehow I was going to get through it um and I don't know quite why I believe that I mean I think in some ways um although my childhood in some ways was there had some some real challenges. I think the the kind of positive of that was that um I had to be quite resilient and um stand on my own two feet from quite young and I had to take on quite a lot of responsibility. And I think I did get quite a lot of strength from that and just thinking actually I'm not going to let this ruin my life. I'm going to come through it and I'm going to find a way through it. So from almost like I had the eating disorder for seven years, but I think probably I say the first two years were kind of all a bit um, of a blur and I was kind of very in it, but then I kind of, then I was kind of deciding what I wanted to try and get well. Um, so I was kind of trying to do it a lot on my own as well. Like, so I was kind of, you know, just trying to do it by kind of sheer willpower of trying not to binge, trying not to purge, doing all of that. Um, so I kind of knew quite early on, this was kind of, this wasn't helpful and I needed to find a way through it, but I just didn't, you know, I didn't quite know how I was going to get to that point. Mm. Um, yeah you did which is amazing <laughs> and how is that kind of like obviously the work you do now you work as an eating disorders counsellor you work within the nhs it was it your journey that brought you to where you are now then 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think I was classically the kind of, when I started out, I was classically the kind of wounded healer. Um, and I, I mean, I think I knew from my early 20s, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I had no idea really quite how I was going to do it. You know, like I hadn't really, I think so much of my younger energy was directed into like not doing farming and getting away from that. I hadn't really got a constructive plan in place. Do you know what I mean? I just kind of knew, yeah, I kind of vaguely, I knew I wanted to kind of help people. But um, not that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't want to milk the cows anymore. Um, yeah, so um yeah so so definitely i mean i i, I started my counseling training when i was 24 um so yeah and i i kind of knew that's what i wanted to do so it absolutely did inform kind of an um in, you know um influence what i ended up doing as a career oh, so i was gonna say did growing up on a farm affect your affect your relationship with food at all was it a dairy farm i mean does did you did it affect how you approach food now or it, as a child is it affect how you age or anything like that does that make sense yeah i mean i think um yeah i mean it's basically it was mainly arable farm actually but they had the dairy, my dad's got a dairy herd as well so um i mean i think really kind of growing up like we we ate everything like we obviously weren't vegetarians kind of having like animals on the farm and everything you know so we we're kind of um yeah so sort of ate everything I, I suppose my you know my mum's really good like home cooking and everything so I think I had a kind of real appreciation of food and um um obviously like kind of taking care of animals and all that kind of thing you know I suppose you have a yeah you have a greater appreciation of kind of where your foods come from and um an, an understanding of that um I think as well I was very lucky that in terms of um I think we just we lived such an active lifestyle constantly sort of like having to work on the farm as well and everything that really um I mean as, as a child I ate loads of sugar and you know my teeth have really suffered but never kind of had you know we we're all kind of like healthy weight just from such an active lifestyle really so there was never anything about kind of good or bad foods or um mm. you know we just kind of ate the whole range of foods really and I think that's really that is it's really important isn't it i think as a parent especially and trying to raise your children to have a healthy relationship with food i think you know we talk a lot don't we in the nun diet world about the inherited stuff we bring with us the baggage we bring with us but that it is so important isn't it to have that kind of like neutral and uh, model that for your kids around around food and not use that dichotomous kind of language because it's still so insidious is it's everywhere still isn't it this good bad clean dirty junk you know it's hard yeah well no I think it, it, it is really hard isn't it and I think um you know obviously I've got three children and um you know a teenage daughter as well mm. um and um you know it's so interesting I think you know she's just starting to absorb a lot of those messages from her friends and obviously she doesn't really want to listen to what I've got to say because I'm her mum and I don't I don't I don't know the answer to these things so I mean it is really challenging isn't it I think um but I, yeah with my own children I really just try to um model um you know we we just don't have good and bad foods we eat a whole range of things they see me regularly eating um a whole range of foods as well and I, I kind of think kind of modeling is often the best way isn't it rather than even mm. from what you're what you're saying um mm. yeah so definitely yeah, kind of work, work to try and do that but it's interesting isn't it the teen thing in particular I think um my son is still slightly oblivious to it but my middle daughter who's 11 even, she's becoming more and more aware of that language even amongst her friends she's got friends who at the age of 11 have said things like I need to go on a diet you know, do you think this generation are under a different kind of pressure, like a different level of awareness compared to perhaps our own, our own generation? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts younger, doesn't it? Just perhaps this whole awareness and just with all the social media stuff. And I, I know there's been quite a lot recently. Um, I haven't looked at it, but just heard about it all kind of TikTok as well, promoting mm. a lot of diets and everything. Mm. So, and I mean, people are on TikTok from like so young, aren't they? So, you know, I think it's really hard when you're exposed to all of that. I think there's much more pressure. Um, I think on the other hand as well, just the, the younger generation growing up, I think um, some of them do really embrace kind of body sort of positive messages and intuitive eating and much more kind of body acceptance. I think maybe in a way that um, kind of older generations didn't do that in quite the same way. So 
I, th I think there's kind of pros and cons really but mm. I, I think it's hard isn't it probably the, the kind of diet messages are, are and um, perfected images are more intense than the more productive messages yeah they have more leverage don't they because I guess that's where mm. the, the you know still for the diet industry that's where the money is you know by selling this kind of highly curated artificial image um, yeah. but I think we're also still sold that belief isn't it that if we can look a certain way then everything else in our life will be fixed everything's perfect yeah. if you you know can yeah it feels like there's, there's like no middle ground now though, isn't it it's like you've got the quite aggressive social media and like you say the tiktoks and the instagram and the fitness models and the the fitness industry that I am part of is certainly saying one message. Um, and then you've got the more openness to mental health now. Everyone's, you know, be kind and a lot more uh, mental health awareness to eating disorders and mm. depression and everything that all links them together. But then you haven't got that middle ground yet, I don't think, really, or it's just starting to form that sort of um, stops out of bridges. So you've got one, one side shouting at you to be a certain way. And then there's nothing to sort of, there's no like safety net until it's too late. And then you've got, okay, you've got mental health issues, it's okay to have them. But there's no sort of bridging that gap. Does that make sense? So there's no one's really sort of um, building that safety net before someone falls into the acceptance. It's okay to have mental health, but there's nothing really to help people stop from going down that rabbit hole. I yeah no, no definitely you know i mean i think i think you're really right actually i think there there is a big kind of gap in between and i think there's kind of yeah it is very much isn't it because i think there's a lot of people as well probably have disordered eating but they wouldn't identify perhaps with the eating disorder side of things mental health side of things mm. um they would see themselves more in the kind of um fitness space where they're kind of trying to promote kind of health and all, all the rest of it and I think you're really right, really, that there's a, there's a big kind of gap in the middle. Um, and it's quite hard, isn't it? I think it's all very well. you kind of got intuitive eating on one end and kind of like completely accepting your body. But that's just a step way too far for a lot of people. You definitely need some sort of in, some integral kind of steps to kind of get from one place to the other. Yeah, and I think it's quite easy for people to then hide behind certain things. They could use um, the body positivity movement as a way to hide uh, eating sort of one way, made like overeating. Um, and then you've got the fitness industry where you can be training six times a day and controlling every macro you eat. And that's another way of someone just disguising um, an underlying issue, but no one's not really addressing it. Yeah, no, sure. No, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think it, that there is a big gap there. And I think um, it's really helpful maybe that kind of more people, I guess like yourselves really are stepping forward to try and kind of fill that place. Yeah. How would you, no. Is there a way you can see that gap ever getting filled? I know obviously the work we're doing and you're doing yourself, um, but do you think it's something that in the future is going to become better? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think all the kind of good work that's being done at the moment about people being able to be more open about their kind of mental health. And I think that's kind of, um, I think that there's a lot more kind of stigma, the stigma is being reduced in a way. So people feel that they can be more open. Um, I mean, I think as well, I'm noticing more and more people um, that interact with me on my account as well. They probably wouldn't be able to, ha wouldn't have a clinical eating disorder and they wouldn't get NHS treatment, but they are really identifying with a lot of the things that I'm talking about. So I think they're still starting to realise as well. You know, there's a, I think there's a kind of like um, a movement and awareness of people starting to realise actually this isn't actually healthy, um, mm. starting to make that shift. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I hope that that bridge will be gap, that gap will be bridged and the more and more people are kind of talking about things more. And I think that brings us on to something really important. And I'd love your thoughts on it, Harriet, is, you know, we talk a lot about there is no one size fits all. There's no perfect way of eating. But there are kind of red flags that, you know, aren't necessarily a clinical eating disorder, but do mark that actually a relationship with food might not be that healthy. You know, in your opinion, as, as a professional, what do you think some of those main characteristics are? Well, we should begin to actually become a little bit more question whether or not that the, the way we're interacting with food or exercise perhaps isn't serving us. You know, it's not really the most healthy way forward. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's when you've got really rigid um, rules that you feel that you have to adhere to. Um, 
and if you can't um, adhere to those you get really really anxious um, so it starts to interfere mm -hmm. with your life um, and I think if you are you know yeah if you're really restricting your eating if you're cutting out certain food groups if you're having to kind of control your macros or whatever in a way that's really affecting you in terms of like your social life your anxiety everything you can do if you're binging if you're kind of purging through um, making yourself sick, taking laxatives, taking diet pills, if you're over-exercising, all of those things are kind of warning signs, really. Um, I guess if you really kind of get obsessed about numbers in terms of your weight or your measurements, if you're constantly body checking, if you're comparing your body with other people all the time, um, all those things, I think, are, are kind of real mm. kind of like warning sort of flags to look out for. And what would you say would be like the first steps? What's the most supportive thing someone can do if they are listening to this and they go, actually, do you know what? I think I'm becoming aware that actually this isn't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm acting out some of those things. I think the first thing is probably just try to talk to someone really, um, you know, to talk to either like a close friend or a family member, um, or they could even go to their GP and when they're able to do that you know we're not in lockdown um but i guess it's kind of like really step one is just acknowledging that you have mm. a problem really i think that's the first thing to do and i think it's difficult to acknowledge it because you know we are and i think james alluded to it we've so normalized a lot of that language we've so normalized you know what we see being sold especially on fitspo and fitness accounts as normal and it just it just isn't is it it's just so far the other way now I think you know but I think what you said about anxiety is really pertinent as well I think there's so much anxiety built around our eating and our um exercising because there's this fear of not either being ex I don't know what your thoughts are on Harriet but whether or not it's kind of like being not being acceptable for wider society or not being acceptable or um yeah you know what are your thoughts on like the, the bigger that bigger kind of um, subject of our stigma around weight and what's acceptable in society and the kind of like moral moral attributes we give to certain sizes and the thin ideal what you, what, you know yeah no, I mean I think it's so tricky isn't it because I think these messages are instilled in us from so young you know like from disney princesses or whatever you're watching yeah, on tv yeah. or whatever and i think it's um you know i think we all kind of carry those messages don't we they're so kind of deeply ingrained um it's it's quite sort of tricky it, i think you don't sometimes even um i think many people just aren't even aware almost of their mm -hmm. sort of prejudice or the way they're kind of judging people um, so I think we've got a long, long way to go on that. I mean, I think um, I think all the kind of great stuff that's happening with Gen Z coming through and kind of really starting to challenge that and the body positive movement. And I think there is now so much more kind of acceptance and celebration of a kind of diversity of a range of bodies. Um, but I, th I think we've got a long way to go with that. And I think the trouble is as well with the diet industry being so, so kind of powerful and so strong and... Um, you know, I think a lot of people have kind of just kind of got the blinkers on to like listening to the other messages um, because it's become very black and white, hasn't it? Kind of like thin is good in a way and um, mm. being overweight is bad. And sometimes I think people don't kind of get beyond that really. Um, and because I think there's so much people carry so much shame and um, self-hatred and self-loathing sometimes when they're in a bigger body because of all these messages. Um, they're not willing to kind of just give up on those, you know, to let go of those really have you ever come across kind of barriers when you know when you're talking to people outside of you know eating disorders treatment about the nun diet approach have you ever come across any kind of peer barrier or conflict you know you know we talk a lot about obesity and all of those kind of things you know or has everyone is everyone quite open and, and, and accepting in your experience i mean i think not at all really um i mean I th yeah I, I think i think it's really quite difficult i mean i think um I guess I'm guilty myself sometimes as well of um, not speaking out perhaps as much as I should or um, yeah you know perhaps not challenge you know not almost because of um, 
I guess just with the energy I put out into my job, I sometimes feel like I haven't got that much <laughs> left over. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I kind of like, so, so I think I, I am guilty of hearing, say like if I've been at the gym, someone kind of really praising someone else's weight loss and something. And I've kind of like thought in my head, I kind of want to step forward here and say something. Um, but I think I'm aware as well sometimes, I think we were talking a bit about earlier about that kind of gap between one end of things and the other. I think the problem is sometimes I kind of feel like stepping in at that moment, sometimes you're just going to polarise things even more because of, I think people are just so far from that place where they're going to be able to kind of understand even what you're trying to say mm. or take that on board. Mm. So I think there's a lot of kind of education and stuff that needs to be done a bit more in that kind of in, in that middle ground to kind of bridge the gap really. Mm. And do you find, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel uncomfortable and I don't know what James is the same, is that having those conversations or trying to make those challenges, but we're coming from it in bodies that are at normal weights. Yeah. You know, definitely. we carry a lot of thin privilege. So, you know, supporting the body positivity movement is one thing, but, you know, it's not necessarily our story to tell. Yeah. Does that make sense? Am I making it? Like, yeah. No, and definitely. I, I could become fearful, actually, of not wanting to encroach or co opt or be another person in a small body saying, oh, you should be able to, you should, you know, have this great relationship with food. And, you know, people turn to me and say, well, that's okay for you. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, I, I think I think I think it's a really good point, isn't it? Because I think it's um, yeah, to be able to kind of really reach people and for people to kind of listen to you and empathise, they want to kind of really feel that you kind of get them. And actually, you can have as much, you can try as hard as you can, can't you, to kind of empathise. But I think it's very hard if you're not genuinely to have stood in someone else's shoes. Um, mm. I mean, I think as well, what's what's tricky is I think I'm just thinking about some of my patients as well that um. Have anorexia now and um, but as teenagers they were overweight and and really badly bullied and really made to feel so ashamed and um i think just the, the fear and the sh you know and the shame and the anxiety the thought of any kind of weight gain is so linked back to that just horror that, that you know what they experienced back then mm -hmm. um and um and I think as a therapist, you know, you can come at it and you're kind of thinking it in a much more kind of rational way that, of course, you know, you're not, we're not talking about you becoming, um, you know, we're talking about you trying to find a healthy weight. Um, but in terms of how they feel about that, um, it's, um, it's quite terrifying, I think. And I think it's, you know, it's genuinely probably quite hard to really empathise with that unless you've been in that place. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's important that we, we say it, you know, and we acknowledge that, isn't it, that we acknowledge our thin privilege for sure for myself mine comes from social media pressures you know i'm looking at these people on um instagram and they're saying they're natural lifters a lot of them are enhanced lifters they're taking a lot of gear steroids um mm -hmm. and they're promoting this message of you know i'm a natural lifter um you can look like me in this 12 week plan follow my secret diet plan um and i think that's a big issue for i see in the fitness industry not so much limb privilege um, but people who are using enhancements and then selling like snake oil, i.e. supplements saying, take this supplement, that will fix you, make you a big, strong man. Um, mm. or, and women, because women doing it as well. Women yeah. take, take um, performance enhancement drugs and then claim their physique's natural and they got it by doing their skinny tea booty camp, do you know? And I think that's, mm. that's more damaging than, um, or I worry more about that than slim privilege in the fitness industry. Sure. Well, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because I guess you kind of, I guess I'm kind of thinking there's a whole kind of um, potential kind of client group there that never probably will even walk into an NHS setting to get help for disordered eating because it's not no, kind not of, sure. see yeah. Um, but, and yeah. it'll be a sort of like hidden thing, you know, and then what's worrying is young men looking at that and then trying mm -hmm. to achieve these unrealistic body goals these guys who are walking around at like 15 stone and 10 percent body fat that's just it's ridiculous um mm -hmm. looking like they're going looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger and mm -hmm. telling these young guys who did it by doing their push-ups and um eating their chicken and broccoli and not mm -hmm. the amount of growth hormone they're injecting into their butt mm -hmm. I know one guy um when I first started training he to me he was absolutely massive so he would have been about 20 stone and he was yeah. ripped, like, he, he, like all his muscles are out. Um, and he went to a place called Body Po, um, the Body Expo in Birmingham. It's like a big 
body body yeah. show and all, all the fits work to go there and everything um, and he came back from there and he felt so insecure in himself he wore a jumper for a year not to show his arms off because he thought they're too small and he had, like his arms are huge like he was a really really big like yeah. to a young man when I was at the time that was like the pinnacle and he um but then I'm yeah. witnessing that just starting the gym this guy thinks he's too small and wearing a jumper maybe I should not be I think mm. that sort of is only become more and more prevalent in men because I, I think it's just so interesting because I think you know in eating disorder services you probably see one man in like 20 people that walk through the door maybe even less so really underrepresented um so and and I think it's quite rare I think of um I've probably seen like one bodybuilder since I've been um you know sort of practicing and um obviously hearing just the extremes that that person put themselves through um to uh, maintain her physique um but yeah I think it's going to be really interesting isn't it because I, th I think obviously there's a whole kind of um there are many people there they're really really struggling in a very unhealthy way with um their eating and exercise and they're quite you know they're quite hidden at the moment do you think with that bodybuilder the female one you saw and the male ones um do you think the way they run their lifestyle in controlling their diet so much and exercising to like almost like a timetable do you think that will end up being a gateway to more and more eating disorders yeah absolutely absolutely i, I mean i think um i think you know, it's generalisation, but, you know, I think some people almost accept, have accepted that kind of following that disordered eating routes kind of almost become a normal thing that you have to put yourself through to achieve your end goals. You know, you kind of like lost all perspective, really. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about um, Brian Keane, who's somebody, um, I don't know if you've heard of him in the fitness industry, he's got a quite a helpful no. podcast, actually, but he's somebody that used to compete um, and do kind of bodybuilding shows. And I think he kind of like, he, he did like really well when he was doing it, kind of, you know, got to the kind of pinnacle of where he wanted to get to. Um, but he talks very openly as well about when he was, um, when he got to that place, he was, he, he was so dissatisfied with his body because he'd become absolutely obsessed um, with the symmetry and the size of the muscles and how everything looked. And um, because I think, when you do something like bodybuilding you can't help but get really kind of obsessed and preoccupied and scrutinizing every body part and I mean in a way that's going to affect your mental health isn't it and um it's going to lead to disordered eating really it's almost inevitable I think mm. um so I guess you know it's not true for everybody I think maybe some people can do bodybuilding and stay sane and kind of manage it in a healthy way but I think for a lot of people um, they're experiencing some sort of disordered eating and they're very vulnerable as well to their mental health worsening. Yeah. Do you yeah. think there is a rise in, um, you know, there is a rise, we, we know that from studies, don't we, in men and boys experiencing disordered eating, um, but you're still not seeing that so much present in clinic then. So do you think a lot of men are still, and boys especially, I mean, when we were talking the other day, James, weren't we, we were talking about how I've, I have friends whose children are anywhere between the ages of 13 and 16 and they're obsessed with getting big and their parents have bought them pull-up bars and you know they they want to eat the chicken and the sweet potato and already at that young age and I'm thinking surely that is this that's the same as is that the same as my 11 year old saying mommy I feel fat and I think I need to go on a diet you know where's it's hard to but is that the channel, yeah. you know, is that where it's going to manifest for boys? You know, do you think there's a different, the difference between the genders? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think with, with men generally, it does tend to be more the fitness side of it rather than mm. the diet. Um, often like an obsession, you know, with exercise tends to come first. And, and yes, like that's often kind of being bigger and being ripped, having a six pack those kind of things so I mean I think yeah I think I'm sure we're going to go and see more and more people um in, in clinic um in the future kind of going down that route but I think again it's just that I'm kind of thinking again about kind of bridging that gap between the middle ground because I think as well um as a society we've become so um anxious about our child perhaps perhaps coming obese or something so I think sometimes parents I guess are thinking they're doing the right thing sometimes aren't they by encouraging perhaps almost this overactivity or mm. um yeah and, and they're not kind of realizing in a way where's that kind of healthy balance um somewhere in the middle and I think we hear that kind of 
I hear it a lot, but even with tiny tinies, you know, you hear the language of, oh, you mustn't eat that. Literally, I've heard, I've had teachers um, and teaching assistants message me on Instagram to say they've been in the food hall and the dinner ladies have said, no, you can't have that because to another one of that, because that will make you fat. And these are mm. sort of like four or five year old children. You know, it's where do you yeah. think we can, where do you think we need to apply the pressure or where do you think we as you know individuals working in the non-diet space can have the most influence where do you think we should begin <laughs> um i mean i guess it's you know it's kind of um educating parents isn't it i guess so so that they can I mean, I suppose it's all levels. I suppose I'm thinking, you know, the younger you can start with all of this, the better. Um, because I think it's much harder once someone has had um, unhelpful messages right through their childhood, it's quite difficult for someone to kind of shed those beliefs and um, as they move into adulthood, you know. So I think the younger, the better, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it, it does need to be. I'm, I'm sort of even thinking like... Um, you know like with healthy week and things in schools you know i know for my children that healthy week had a big influence if that i mean i did go in and do a talk on mental health i was lucky in my, our children's school to be able to do that but i think it's it's being able to kind of bring in kind of those kind of aspects about kind of like intuitive eating not having good bad food celebration of all body sizes from quite young um so i think it's got to be in schools and i think it's trying to get the message across as well because i think ultimately children learn most from their parents don't they and if, if you've got parents that are carrying these messages often quite unconsciously um that's it's, it's difficult really um but i don't know i think i think there's a lot of good stuff isn't there on social media maybe we need more on television and stuff like so many people watch all these crazy like diet oh, yeah. programs don't they if there was yeah. more programs on that were kind of bridging the gap that's yeah. the kind of way isn't it can start to spread the message a bit more definitely and i think that those kind of tv programs again just go to normalize that kind of it, i didn't even bring myself to watch it in fact i didn't even want to mention the documentary on my platform the other week um the uh the cycling restaurant where they spun they did spin lessons and yeah they found their food. you know i think i felt that was so unhealthy and so i didn't want to draw anyone's attention to it because i didn't want them to turn yeah. around in case it yeah. was a trigger but you know that you know how on earth has that come to be something that we deem a normal form of entertainment yeah. or tv show you know it's as you say i think it's gone the other way but yeah starting with them when they're little definitely definitely mm, yeah and getting more gps on board if the yeah. if they yeah. you know how you said the nhs hasn't quite aren't quite there yet with the message um, and if you've got some old school gp saying fat is fat and that's unhealthy and bad so they're fat shaming mm. from a medical point of view. And if you're going in to the doctor surgery with, with your child or as a person, yeah. the doctor's telling you that your BMI is too fat, you need to drop drop weight mm. or your child's BMI is too mm. high and they're unhealthy. As a parent, yeah. you think you're going to be doing the right thing by then restricting their food or making them go out and do more exercise, which I know is healthy anyway, not to restrict food, but to do exercise. But yeah. It's sort of planting that negative seed, isn't it? Yeah, so if you can get definitely. more GPs on board and the NHS on board and get them, like say, on television talking about it. I think getting stuff on TV um, and, you know, because I, I guess there's so many of these kind of programmes on, aren't there? I mean, I don't, I'm not really up to date with things. I don't tend to watch them, but there's always some kind of um, diet thing on, isn't there? Mm. Or the greatest loser or something. But if, mm. um, if there was other kind of more kind of um, helpful messages going out, it's going to have an influence. So much of this as well is about, um, it is about food and all those messages, but as well, it's about raising children that have a robust self-esteem and can, you know, because I think if you feel good about yourself generally and you feel like you're not, you know, just judged by your shape and body weight, in a way you can look at those messages and you've almost got a protective skin where you don't have to engage with them as much. Um, you know, and I know that's a big ask because like for lots of children as well, they're quite sensitive and you have a thin skin. It's really hard not to be affected by those messages. But I kind of think as well, the more we can help children to kind of grow up with a healthier kind of self-esteem to be a bit more kind of um, to feel better about themselves in a way, then you don't need to engage with some of this stuff that's being bombarded at you. Um, mm. I mean, I think as well, I'm quite 
it may all go horribly wrong for me, but I think I'm, I'm just incredible. I've watched my daughter at the moment um, who um, just at the moment, she hasn't got a huge awareness about the kind of weight shape stuff. I mean, she, some things are coming through, but just to see in a way, because she does feel quite just good about herself. She, in a way, she's not engaging with a lot of that stuff. Um, mm. And that might just be down to her personality. You know, she, she is someone who's a bit more thick skinned and, you know, it might all go horribly wrong. <laughs> Um, but I kind of think for her, a really strong protective factor is that she's got good self-esteem. So she's going to be mm. much better. Going to be, she's got a bit of an armour on to deal with all this stuff that's going to come at her. Yeah. And understanding that her value and her worth is something yeah. else. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're different conversations completely. You know, and I think that's yeah hugely yeah. valuable. And I think my, my 11 year old is quite similar. She's aware that her body is changing. And it's actually at this point in time that she's at now where I became acutely self-aware. I was yeah. very much teased for putting on puppy fat. You know, I was, I had the classic go out before I didn't even go up very much, but I went out and mm. I was, yeah, I was teased and bullied relentlessly for that weight gain at school. Whereas mm. she's, because we've had the conversations, I'm very, we're very open. Yeah. We talk about how your body, you know, how this is, these are all normal, you know, this is normal. This is, yeah, we don't talk sure. about body to anything else other than how they function in our house. Yeah, sure. And so she's like, oh, yeah, this is because, you know, oh, yeah. And she almost like, she embraces part of mm, all of it because yeah. it's part of her journey. Mm. And I think, mm. you know, being able to talk about bodies in a really neutral way as well. Yeah, isn't it? really helpful. Very helpful. Harry, if you uh, had access to being a big billboard up that the whole world could see, what message would you put on it? <laughs> Um, I don't know, it sounds like really cliche, <laughs> but I think it, it, it's something about like, like being yourself and, you know, not kind of feeling that you've got to please other people. And um, so I think so much of like my own journey was, you know, so much about my eating disorder and so much about kind of like my struggles in my early life were in a way like trying to kind of please people around me, not really being authentic and like listening to myself. and. Um, you know so I suppose you know for me that was a huge part of my journey so yeah I mean it sounds really cliche but um I think you know it's about like being authentic like be yourself mm -hmm. and um and and like almost like kind of having that trust in a way that you know I do believe everybody's got their own sort of special things that you know things that are really special about them and actually when we can actually really embrace that and celebrate that and stop comparing ourselves to try and be like someone else then actually that's the true way to kind of feeling you know, joyful and happy and fulfilled. Definitely. And cliches become cliches because they're true. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <Yeah. laughs> Bring true things on a billboard. <laughs> Where can um, our club members find you? So they wanted to follow your work um, and get in touch. How could they do that? Yeah. So my Instagram is food underscore freedom underscore coach underscore so yeah food freedom coach and um my website is foodfreedomcoach.co.uk so yeah Fabulous. either of those are good i'm um, in instagram is always a good place to start because i do yeah. try and post there quite regularly yeah you're very and and harriet has incredible your, your posts are really valuable on it in the realms of instagram i find your posts fantastic because you share so much knowledge it's not just a pretty picture you know you're they're fantastic and you also have your podcast what's your podcast called yes okay yeah so yeah and that's just food freedom coach brilliant freedom and they can coach, find yeah. that by where they normally find their podcast um, so at the moment yeah at the moment i've just got it on podbean and like apple itunes so um i need to kind of be a bit proactive in sharing that but yeah at the moment so it's on podbean and, and apple um Fabulous. yeah that's great okay brilliant Thank you so much, um, Harriet. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, thank yeah. you. And like, <laughs> you know, all the best with like this exciting new venture. Um, thank you for tuning in. And we hope you have taken something away from listening. Perhaps one small action you can put into practice today. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So pop on over to Reframe Club where you can share them, your own reflections and experiences. We would love to hear from you. As always, here at Reframe Club, we are rooting for you.